Ever since I was a kid, I've come in touch with our ancestors' heritage. As soon as I was old enough to travel on my own, my childhood memories drove me to destinations where I could keep on living the charm of the ancients. The more I searched, the more I found a multitude of lesser known but still impressive sites. Then, a few years ago, by complete chance, I discovered that an abundance of little-known ancient marvels lay just around the corner. Italy is certainly famous for a lot of good reasons. Just to name a few, there is excellent food, beautiful beaches, art cities, culture, fashion, and so on. Not many people know, though, that there is a real treasure trove of puzzling buildings and constructions. They sum up in the order of thousands, like the Nuraghi in Sardinia. The great majority of these sites enjoy few visitors for a variety of reasons. They may not be the most impressive, or they simply are not sufficiently promoted. Sometimes, they are still so much a part of modern people's lives that they are appreciated more for their structural services rather than for their historical significance. Whatever the reason, there's still a thick veil over their existence, which in the past decades is slowly being raised. Among these little-known structures are a series of fortified cities in the central part of the Italian peninsula. What makes these sites stand out are their polygonal walls. In this documentary, I will lead you on a journey across different regions of central Italy in the search and discovery of these amazing places. But before we start the adventure, let's quickly answer a few questions. Why are polygonal walls so interesting? Well, just look at them. If you should make a stone wall with chisel and hammer, would you carve the blocks with such shapes? And while having only winches and ropes and no automated labor force, would you choose blocks that weigh tons or sometimes even dozens of tons? But polygonal walls, beside being intriguing for their strangely shaped blocks, are also interesting for another reason. They can be found all over the world. Probably the most famous and precisely carved are found in Peru, but to a lesser extent they are found also in Egypt, Cambodia, Turkey, Japan, Easter Island, and so on. We'll raise this issue again at the end of our exposition. This weird technique seems to have been chosen and appreciated in many different places across the globe. Central Italy gives us the chance to visit, within a few hundred kilometers, many sites that feature polygonal walls. By identifying similarities, common schemes, or even differences, we hope to contribute in shedding some light on this ancient riddle.
we started our journey from the archaeological site of Roselle, near Grosseto in Tuscany. This is actually one of the few sites on our list with entrance ticket and fences. It's considered a true archaeological site. Both Etruscan as well as Roman remains have been found in Roselle. While the ruins attributed to the Etruscans are crude and honestly not really impressive, the Roman ruins include nice walls, some columns and some mosaics. There is even a nicely preserved Roman amphitheatre which delighted our visit. By following the path on the map, we then stumbled on this wall. There's a boulder here, but how big it is! It's massive! The size of the stones was just unbelievable. This is a polygonal wall of the second kind, where the stones are roughly carved to fit with each other and spaces are filled with smaller stones. Nonetheless, the wall is 3 kilometers long, an average of 7 meters high, and the biggest stone is reported to be 2.75 meters by 1.2 meters. This wall definitely deserved to be called Cyclopean. Allegedly, the stones were rolled downhill from quarries further up. The wall is officially attributed to the Etruscans and is supposed to have been built around the 7th century BC. But we couldn't help asking ourselves how was it possible that the people who built this would build this. Next we move to the small city of Amelia, in the region called Umbria. This city is still inhabited today. The polygonal walls that embrace the historical center are a normal part of people's lives. Houses and turrets have been built in the millennia inside and over the walls, and people don't seem to notice them too much. As therefore is expected, there is no ticket and little indication that the place is of any archaeological importance. This wall is of the third kind, meaning that the edges of the stones are carved in such a way to perfectly match the edges of the stones next to it. We could walk for a few hundred meters along this wall. We also noticed that the corner stones of the wall were carved in the shape of the corner. Again, the stones were of cyclopean sizes, with a good level of precision in the stones' cuts, with single stones having up to 12 sides. One could clearly see the lower quality of the more recent walls built on top of the polygonal ones. In 2006, a 30 meter long stretch of the wall collapsed due to as yet unclarified reasons, plant growth and water infiltration being the possible causes, and the fallen stones gave us a chance to better see their incredible size. Gigantesque! Look at that one! Huge! Yeah, that's a giant one! The fact that the wall has yet to be repaired might give us a clue as to the importance of the work that has to be done to put the stones back into their place. And we have technology at our disposal that the people who supposedly built these walls didn't have. And, as a matter of fact, we don't have to cut them and bring them here. Furthermore, we only have to repair 30 meters. The ancients built thousands of meters of walls. 
part of the wall surrounding the historical center is today of Roman or medieval construction, but the difference in building style clearly shows the technical superiority of the most ancient polygonal masonry. According to some researchers, these walls were allegedly built by the Pelasgians, a pre-Roman people coming from the east. Others believe they were built around the 4th century BC. At this site, some stones were also monstrous in size. So far in our trip, we have been able to learn that these walls tend to be closed, with a perimeter in both cases over 2 km long. We could identify two distinct styles of construction, one of the second kind and one of the third kind. The first one being more rough, the second one more refined, with closely fitting stones of all shapes. In both sides, some stones are really massive in size. We moved then to the region of Lazio. Here, after roaming in the countryside for a while, we were finally able to find this abandoned building which, in the middle of nowhere, features a spectacular segment of polygonal wall. Again, we could see that much more recent walls have been built on top of it. These are obviously of a lower building quality and were built in the 19th century. Behind the polygonal wall, there's a grotto which is Roman in origin. We have a few accounts from researchers in the 18th and 19th century who describe the walls as a quadrangle with 90 meter long sides. 50 meters of one wall are still visible today, the rest having vanished in the wind of time. An interesting feature we found for the first, but not last time, is a carving of three phalluses. These are partly covered by a later wall, but a drawing of 1828 shows them how they must have appeared to the explorers of the time. Also note that in the drawing there's no second wall on top of the polygonal wall. Interestingly, in some areas on the line between the polygonal construction and the more modern wall, a sort of hybrid of the two modes of construction has been created. The hybrid of the two modalities of construction, like in alto. As up there, where there are still some polygonal boulders, probably put back in place after a collapse, alternating with concrete, bricks and smaller stones. Mattoni e massetti più piccoli. The joints of the stones are quite precise, considering that they are made of sandstone conglomerate, a quite weak type of rock. The wall has several high and narrow windows, a feature we didn't see again. The site was allegedly built by Romans in the 2nd century BC, but there's different opinions as to the builders and the dating. Basically, it doesn't seem to have been studied a lot. Next, our wanderings took us to Abruzzo, yet another region of central Italy. The mountains here have the highest peaks of the whole Apennine mountain chain. On the top of a small hill, surrounded by wonderful landscapes, lies the ancient city of Alba Fucens. A few people still live inside the original polygonal wall, which surrounds the top of the hill for a total length of 2900 meters. Older pictures, 
still give us a hint of how it was, but vegetation and human constructions have meanwhile covered long parts of it. Once through the wall, we entered a strange world made of ancient ruins alternating and mixing in with modern buildings. The main site lies at the bottom of a small basin. The ancient roads of the site are made of a beautiful white stone. We were the only visitors at the site which didn't have any fences or ticket counter. But the main attraction to us was this polygonal wall. Three niches are incorporated into the wall which give them a particularly Peruvian taste. By going closer, we could see that the niches, or false doors, are polygonal in their inside walls as well. One can only speculate about the original purpose of them, but we know that in ancient cultures, false doors were portals to the realms of the dead. We also wondered, why would a culture capable of doing this wall do a brick column? Alba Fucins displays some really peculiar and distinctive stone cuts. More Roman walls built on underlying polygonal walls. The general impression is that there is a deeper layer to the whole site, which was partly covered by later constructions and accumulated debris. You see where it collapsed, you can see there were more polygonal boulders underneath. Although the three niches wall didn't have surprisingly large stone blocks, other walls featured neatly jointed cyclopean ones. The whole main site alternates polygonal walls, small stone walls, brick walls and other artifacts which give the general impression that it's been built and rebuilt a few times during its history, partly recycling each time what was already there from the people before. On the highest part of the hill, there is a relatively modern church built on a Greco-Roman temple to Apollo. Part of the original columns have been integrated in the church's walls, and most of the stones used to erect the church were taken from the original temple. But again, we notice that the basement on which the temple, and later the church, were built, is of a different kind of stone, with much larger blocks some parts even seem to be polygonal masonry. A five minutes walk from the church, we came upon a beautifully restored amphitheater of the Roman era. With the high peaks in the background, it must have been an enchanting place. But when we got closer, we noticed again that some parts of the theater were built incorporating segments of polygonal walls. The arch of the entrance is of 20th century reconstruction. From this historical picture, you can see that what was found when the excavations of the amphitheater began were only the polygonal walls. So everything we see today, this entry vault, this is all part of the reconstruction work. Basically, both entrances are built along polygonal walls. Second entrance, there is this corner column of square-shaped boulders and then, again, a wall of polygonal boulders on this side. 
su questo lato e in maniera analoga and similarly we have a wall of polygonal boulders on the other side of the entrance sull'altro lato dell'entrata this site also brought us a few doubts confusion as to who built these places is already high due to many different architectural styles mixed with each other over the millennia to this we can now add the fact that it is not always clear what was originally found and what was reconstructed by archaeologists. The amphitheater is a glaring example of this. The official dating is the 3rd century BC and the city was allegedly built by the Romans. We really enjoyed staying in Alba Fucens, spending more than four hours inside the perimetral wall. In these last two sites we could identify the same characteristic scene before. To these we can now add that inside the enclosing wall a variety of different buildings with polygonal masonry can be found. These have often served as the foundations for later constructions clearly identified with known ancient populations. The most glaring example of this could be seen at the top of the hill, where a Christian church, partially built with the remains of a Roman temple, was erected over a polygonal base. New features were carvings, niches and windows. Ferentino, in the region of Lazio, features a 2.5 km long polygonal wall around its historical center. People still live both inside as well as outside the walls, where the city has spread in the recent past. Some parts of the wall are built with three different techniques. Large polygonal blocks at the bottom, smaller squared blocks in the middle and even smaller blocks fixed with mortar on top. The polygonal wall is officially attributed to pre-Roman peoples and is supposed to have been built sometimes between the 6th and the 4th century BC. Inside the outer wall we could find a second small section of wall beneath a church. The rock type doesn't actually look that hard. Nonetheless, the wall is more than 2000 years old and still supports modern buildings. We are walking along the walls of Ferentino and at times pieces of polygonal walls appear again, as in this point here. It wasn't easy to find the remaining sections of wall. We drove around for a while, stopping whenever we saw them. And here we also have some preserved stretches of wall. It's not obvious to find the Cyclopean walls here in Ferentino, but you can still see some stretches of them. As before, there are the polygonal walls below, the Roman squared walls above, and the village above. Ferentino is one of the Saturnian cities, which, according to tradition, were founded by the god Saturn. According to the legend, Saturn, also called Cronus, had to flee from his son the god Jupiter and landed in central Italy, in the region of Lazio. The name allegedly originates from Latitare, which means being a fugitive. Here he brought civilization to the local people in what became a golden age of peace and prosperity. An easy 15 minutes drive took us to Alatri, the second Saturnian city we visited, which has probably the most famous polygonal walls of central Italy. Like Ferentino, Alatri is still inhabited. 
When approaching the city, we encounter the first wall, which is over two kilometers long, and encircles the historical center. Here too, parts of the wall have been incorporated in the modern city. Even the restaurant where we went for lunch had polygonal walls inside. E cosa nel and what do we find in the restaurant? A piece of polygonal wall. Look, it goes down. Inside the historical center, there's the Acropolis, completely surrounded by a 600 meter long polygonal wall. Up to 16 meters tall, this wall is in very good conditions, with astounding blocks in all shapes and sizes. The Acropolis has two ancient entrances. On the lintel of the minor gate, we find again a carving representing three phalluses, similar to those seen before. Individual blocks with up to nine sides alternate with a wide variety of medium-sized and large stone blocks. As in Alba Fucens, this wall has three niches or false doors, but their size is much larger. Wow. <laughs> Look at the lintel of the gate. Oh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Probably the most astonishing view of Alatri is the major gate. It's 4.5 meters high by 2.75 meters wide, and the lintel is estimated to weigh 27 tons. The blocks just inside the gate are also of gigantic proportions. This is the size of this boulder. Each one is bigger than the other. And this boulder here. On top of the citadel, there is a church but by looking closer, we discovered that the lower part of the church's walls are again polygonal. These are particularly well preserved with neatly cut joints. Considering I'm almost two meters tall, this single block is definitely huge. Sempre la parete della chiesa. The wall of the church, at its base, besides the smooth boulders, has these much rougher boulders, but they seem to be of polygonal origin as well. Here we see a part of the citadel walls seen from inside, with the beautiful hilly landscape of Lazio in the background. The Lazio. What a view! So beautiful. Le colline te la. The estimated date of construction varies from as far back as 1500 BC to 100 BC, depending on the source. The Acropolis was built on a rocky hill, some sections of which are still visible. Archaeoastronomical studies done by different researchers, among whom is Giulio Magli, who works at the Polytechnic of Milan, have shown that the whole wall complex has significant astronomical alignments. These last two sites again confirmed previous observations and added new features of interest. Again we could see more recent walls built on top of ancient ones, the polygonal walls being always at the bottom of the subsequent ones. Alatri showed a new feature not so clearly seen before. We could identify up to three concentric wall systems, if we consider also the polygonal base on which the present church resides. 
Magnificent gates with astoundingly huge lintels appeared for the first time, and carvings as well as niches were again a feature of the walls. We next visited the hill of Monte Circeo, right on the sea. The hill has been associated with Circe, the sorceress visited by Ulysses in his Odyssey. Besides offering breathtaking views of the coast and of the Pontine Islands, there's a beautiful stretch of polygonal wall. On the way to the main part of the wall, we could see other small chunks of it. Reaching it has not been easy, as the path in the thick Mediterranean forest isn't well marked. We are in a spot where the wall has collapsed. At one point, the only way through was on the wall itself, but it was definitely worth the effort. I'm standing here on a final stretch of the wall of the Circei Acropolis. The wall changes direction and continues this way. You can see some stretches going on. The wall ring is roughly four-sided, it stretches 5.6 meters in the sky and has a total length of around 680 meters. It is officially dated around the 4th century BC. In Monte Circeo, we better understood why the polygonal walls in central Italy enjoyed a time of great celebrity during the 19th century. It was a time of great archaeological turmoil and Italians as well as foreigners were fascinated by these ancient relics and their romantic locations. At a certain point, sightseeing tours even included them in their itineraries. People like Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Marianna Candidi Dionigi, Heinrich Schliemann, the discoverer of Troy, Louis Charles François Petit Radel, and many others left us a large quantity of beautiful drawings and documented studies, which in some cases still are the most extensive research done on some sites. People were fascinated by the beauty and the apparent antiquity of their construction, as is clear in this quote from English archaeologist George Dennis in 1848. He who has not seen the so-called Cyclopean cities of Latium and Sabina, of Greece and of Asia Minor, these marvels of early art which overpower the mind with their grandeur, bewilder it with amazement or excite it to active speculations as to their antiquity, the race which erected them and the state of society which demanded fortifications so stupendous on sites, so inaccessible as they in general occupy. He who has not beheld these wonderful trophies of early Italian civilization the bastion around Tower of Norba, the gates of Senia and Arpino, the citadel of Alatri, the many terraces of Cora, the covered way of Praneste, and the colossal works of the same masonry in the mountains of Latium, Sabina and Seminium will be astonished at the first view of the walls of Corsa. With the advent of the 20th century, the charm slowly began to fade, and more rational but also simplistic explanations relegated the polygonal walls of Italy to defensive walls of minor importance. Today, most sites aren't easily accessible and are poorly signposted, if at all. 
this documentary is part of the effort to restore them to their rightful place in Italy's heritage. Majestically standing on top of a hill overlooking the wide Pomptine Plains is the ancient city of Norba. When approaching the site, stone walls appear right on top of the rocky cliffs. The first site we encountered when getting closer was a majestic polygonal wall, at one side of which was an entrance gate, delimited by a particular feature not yet seen in our trip, a rounded tower made of enormous polygonal stone blocks. A 70 meters long wall has an opening which leads to a short tunnel. Here it is hard to see, but the lintel, which is already 2 meters wide by, at the highest point, almost 1 meter, is apparently 2 or more meters deep. Let's go and see. The tunnel is just a few meters long. Ecco, questa è ancora la porta maggiore. This is still the main gate. We have just entered the citadel. Una zona interna alla cittadella. A series of Roman buildings and artifacts have been found inside the walls, which clearly show that the city was inhabited by them. The whole city is officially dated at the 5th or 4th century BC. Whether the walls were already in place at that time is not known. In any case, the different construction style between the polygonal walls and what is certainly Roman can be observed all over the site. E accanto a queste rocce con questa manifattura poligonale, and next to these polygonal rocks, we have the Roman baths made of little stones, quite ridiculous compared to the size of the polygonal boulders. Quanto ridicoli al confronto con la dimensione dei massi poligonali. Norma, Norma, the modern city, Norba, with its stretches of polygonal walls, and here I am on another stretch of polygonal wall. Un altro tratto di muro poligonale. The enclosing wall is over 2.5 kilometers long, but many smaller sections emerge everywhere. The minor Acropolis is also enclosed in a polygonal wall. Inside this Acropolis we found two square polygonal bases. With reference to this platform on top of the Acropolis here in Norba, I recall that already in Alatri, in the Acropolis, in the citadel, there is a church and part of the walls of the church were made of polygonal stones. So, these platforms are not a new feature, except that in the other places, buildings of other faiths, in this case Christian, have been built on top of them. The views from the Acropolis are really wonderful.
According to the legend, the whole hill is full of tunnels, inside of which were alleged to be rich treasures. To our knowledge, nothing of particular interest has been found, but the access has apparently been closed. The hill in the background is Monte Circeo, which we talked about earlier. Much still waits to be excavated at Norba, as in this building, which features polygonal masonry in the inside of the walls. The outside is still underground. Ecco, in questo edificio si può vedere su questa parete. Here in this building you can see on this wall in particular that sooner or later someone plastered these polygonal walls. It's not visible on the other walls, on which instead you can see that kind of ledge protruding along the wall. Here we can see that there were other walls, other buildings, but a massive deforestation work should be done to make them all visible. Excavations probably also. In fact, from the major Acropolis, one could only assume that there is much more still to be discovered, but during our visit there was little to be seen. In our two hours visit we didn't meet any other tourists, which gives an indication of the fact that the site is not promoted at all and is little known. In the background we see the minor Acropolis. These last sites confirmed everything we saw before, from multiple concentric wall systems to majestic sized gates. Norba even featured two acropolis and two summit polygonal bases. A new characteristic that started to emerge is the choice of place, often on top of hills with beautiful views of the surroundings. We encountered the first rounded turret and we could see several polygonal buildings inside the wall's perimeter. A short drive from Norba, across the Monti Lepini, took us to Segni, a small but lively town still inhabited today. Of course, if we decided to go there, there had to be something polygonal, but the surprise didn't end there in Segni. We see stretches of wall still standing and this gate with a 3 meters wide lintel. The Porta Saracena is certainly the most famous, but not the only notable gate, as we found out. We had to ask the local people how to get to this gate, because it is not clearly signposted. There are some signs around indicating a trail, the so-called Trail of the Walls, but it was not easy to find it. Easier than in other places, but not that easy. In Segni there's a real polygonal walls trail, which goes along sections of the wall. Here we have a gate that leads nowhere, because the debris has accumulated on the other side. But there's a gigantic lintel again. And the walls continue. According to researcher Alessandro Colaiacomo, small portions of an even larger wall have been found. Sempre maestoso. Always majestic, the wall continues, and in the distance you can see another gate. Un ulteriore porta. Of notable dimensions is also the gate of Porta Foca.
there is a series of smaller gates, some of which are behind a curtain of growth and are not visible today, as in this case. It is increasingly difficult to find the remains of this wall. We had to walk along a completely bumpy, abandoned path. Even though the tourist maps showed these places, nowadays nobody seems to pass through here anymore. The path, as you can see, seems to be unused, if not completely abandoned. More uphill, we reach a short stretch of wall which was probably part of the Acropolis wall. A little further, there's a church. On closer inspection, we discover that it's built on foundations of polygonal stones, like a two steps truncated pyramid. This masso. This boulder has been shaped to make the corner. The church itself is built with two different kinds of masonry. Square and nicely fitting bigger stones and smaller, more rounded stones with mortar in between. By previous experience, this in itself would suggest the existence of a Greco-Roman temple sometimes in history, as we had observed in Alba Fucens. We found proof of this on a plaque in front of the entrance of the church, which says Temple of Juno Moneta, a Roman goddess. It looks just like a base, because you can see that the upper edge is leveled. It's not uneven, it's all straight. So yeah, it's like some sort of a platform, an altar. Mm -hmm. The wall's construction is dated 6th century BC. Again, we saw a church built on top of a Roman temple, which is built on top of a polygonal wall. Again, the view from the Acropolis was breathtaking. From here you can see two of the sides. It's difficult to see well because there's a bit of mist. Two of the sides where we've already been, Alatri and Ferentino. And behind the hill there's a third side we're visiting tomorrow. Castel San Pietro Romano. On the way to our next destination, Castel San Pietro Romano, we had to take a detour in Palestrina because of a collapsed section of road. And to our surprise, we came across a completely unexpected stretch of polygonal wall. Ecco, qui comincia il muro. So, here begins the wall. You can see it alternating with outcropping rocks. The construction is always the classic polygonal construction. The boulders are big, but we have seen bigger ones. Sono belli grandi, ne abbiamo visti già di più grandi. Further uphill, we encounter two more sections of polygonal walls. Castel San Pietro Romano is on top of an idyllic hill, with amazing views of the surrounding countryside. It is possible to see as far as Rome, a good 30 kilometers away. After some searching, we managed to find a trail leading along a stretch of polygonal wall, which encloses the top of the hill. The construction technique is always the same. By now we have seen many sites. There are really giant boulders alternating with smaller ones. We noticed that, for the third time in our journey, the main church inside the polygonal wall is dedicated to Saint Peter. This might be a coincidence, but it still sounds a lot considering that only seven of the visited sites had any church at all. Every new site confirms what has been observed before, 
Again, churches over polygonal bases, multiple wall systems, impressive gates, integration into later constructions and amazing views. We started our journey back visiting our last destination in the region of Lazio. Right on the sea we encountered the medieval castle of Santa Severa. By getting closer we see that the courtyards and closing buildings have been built over a polygonal wall with mighty stone blocks. Even though the existence of a pre-Roman Etruscan port in the region is documented, the walls are officially attributed to the Romans, which later conquered the place. Other sources suggest they were built by the Pelasgians. A 100 meter long stretch of the original wall was still accessible, whereas the majority has been incorporated into the later buildings or has been destroyed. Here are the last remains, in the background is the castle of Santa Severa, which is medieval in origin, and here the wall turns inwards, enters along the inner wall of the castle, so you cannot see it without entering, and I think it is also covered by a whole series of other buildings. I've seen some photos, inside these buildings you can see some remains. All'interno di queste costruzioni si possono vedere dei resti. It is interesting to note that studies show a part of the original wall to be under the present sea level. Surprisingly, the stones that make up the wall are of two different kinds, limestone and sandstone. Back in Tuscany, we visited the small town of Orbetello, which lies on a peninsula in the middle of a lagoon. Here, on a public parking space, we find what still survives of a long stretch of polygonal wall. According to the official version of history, the wall was built by the Etruscans in the 5th century BC. We couldn't help noticing that the official attribution of polygonal walls changes according to the region where they are found. In Lazio they are mostly attributed to the Romans, now here in Tuscany they are attributed to the Etruscans, the native people of this region. Not much is done today to highlight this ancient artifact, as it seems to be a normal part of people's lives. As we reach the first corner of the wall, things get more interesting. The wall continues along a canal, connecting the two lagoons. Rising more than two meters from the waters, drillings done by researcher Mario Pinkerle have shown that the walls dive a few meters below present sea level. We finished our visit to Orbetello by driving along the third side of the wall.
can now add a new feature to the list, proximity to water. This fact raises new questions as to the dating, since both sites have walls built below the present sea level. A short 15 minutes drive from Orbetello, on a hill at the base of the third tombolo, lies the ancient city of Cosa. Officially erected by the Romans in 273 BC, the city has a wall that encompasses the top of the hill and is 1500 meters long. A trail leads along 300 meters of the wall to a second gate, which we'll see in a short while. It's surprising that, in spite of the similarities and the proximity to Orbetello, mainstream archaeologists maintain that they were built 200 years later by another population. It is curious to note that although we are inside an archaeological area, it is also an area where olive trees are still cultivated. On the top of the hill are two polygonal platforms, both with crumbling buildings on them. This is another platform, again composed of many different building styles. There are these smaller boulders, and then next to them, again, a wall up to four meters high. It looks like maybe three meters, three and a half meters. Parts of the bigger platform are still in good shape. On closer look, we saw that the remains on top of the polygonal platform are of two types. Here's a whole piece of wall of squared boulders, which rest on a base of polygonal boulders, but which are also made of a different stone. There is the base of polygonal boulders, these are square, cubic, and on top of all that, a brick wall, quite high, about 7-8 meters. Again, we see three different construction styles, one over the other. And similarly to the other sites we visited on this trip, there is an absolutely fantastic view from this one too. You can see the three spits which connect the Monte Argentario, today covered by clouds, with the mainland, and there in the center you can see Orbetello, where we were about half an hour ago. In the background, further away, you can also see the Giannella, the Giannella spit. As in other places we visited, in the popular quarters of the ancient city, polygonal masonry alternates with small stones or brick walls. Here we have a wall of small boulders. In this room, on the other side, we have a wall of smooth polygonal boulders. Then we move on. The wall is 1 meter 20, 1 meter 30 wide. Another room where both this side and the other side are polygonal, but with rough boulders. And anyway, it's a room. There also seems to be a doorway there. Let's move on. Again, about a meter and a half a little less of wall, and we have a third room, on this side smooth polygonal boulders, on that side small boulders with lime, anyway some kind of binder. We explored the site for over two hours, but weren't sure that we saw everything there's to see in terms of polygonal masonry.
Sì, questa è un'altra praticamente. Yes, this is another one. Practically the whole building on the four sides has polygonal boulders. Beautiful also these ones. Big. Questi poligonali bellissimi anche questi grossi. We reach the second gate, which is really impressive for its size and the precision of its construction. E qua ci troviamo di nuovo lungo la cinta muraria esterna. And here we are again along the outer walls. Wow! See this? Wow! Well, yes! This is the outer wall. The outer wall. Now we can go from here to the other one. Well, it looks like Roselle. Che bello quest'angolo. What a nice corner, half illuminated. Yes, that corner is beautiful. I've already taken three or four pictures with the giant boulder at its base. Originally there were, or there still are, 18 towers, all square. This is the only one with a circular plan, but it's a different type of masonry. Even if only 300 meters long, the part of the wall which can be visited today stuns the senses with its magnificence. wall exhibits some of the most unusual and distinct stone cuts and joints. With the visit to Cosa, our trip was over and it was time to go back home to start reasoning on what we had seen and experienced. After some research, I stumbled on the work of architect and polygonal masonry researcher Daniele Baldassarre. He compiled a couple of precious books documenting with pictures many places where ancient walls are found. I realized that the sites we had visited are only a small part of the picture. In his books, Baldassarre documents dozens of other sites with polygonal walls. Our observations may certainly be enriched by the study of those sites. These are just a few he includes in the books.
So, let's see one more time what we have discovered. All sites have an enclosure wall. If it isn't all visible today, we could anyway find older testimony of it. They all feature polygonal masonry. One side had walls of the second kind, all the others were third kind, displaying intricate cut patterns. Most of the sites have large blocks, with the biggest weighing an estimated 27 tons. In the innermost part of the wall system, many sites featured one or more polygonal bases, on top of which often a temple and more recently churches were built, showing three distinct layers of construction, with obviously different styles. At least three sites have other smaller polygonal buildings inside the outer wall. Two sites feature three niches, and one site has several thin windows. In two sites, carvings of three phalluses can be seen. Apart from this, there is little more decoration and bas-relief. Some sites have even two concentric wall perimeters, an outer wall and an acropolis wall. Various large gates are still visible, some of which possess huge lintels. Most sites tend to be on top of hills with beautiful views. Two sites have walls below sea level. These are also the only ones not lying on top of a hill. Different rock types have been used. Among these, we identified limestone, sandstone and some kind of conglomerate, allegedly depending on the local availability. We didn't see any harder stone like granite or basalt, as have been found in Peru and other places. Three important questions arise. The first fundamental question is, who built these walls and when? The attribution varies according to the source. The official dating stretches from the first millennium BC to a few centuries BC, and the wall's construction is generally attributed either to the Romans or to the Etruscans or to some other pre-Roman inhabitants of the region. But other sources consider them to be older and the heritage of the mythical Pelasgians, a population of Greek origin, first mentioned by the poet Homer. So, Pelasgians, Etruscans, Romans, other pre-Roman peoples, there is apparent confusion. The uncomfortable truth is that with today's dating technology, we cannot directly date the time when a stone was taken from the quarry, carved and put on the wall. But we observed that in most sites there is a clear sequence of different construction styles, with the polygonal one being at the bottom of later identifiable styles. Various sites also feature similar layouts, with one external wall, one internal wall or acropolis, inside of which reside one or more rectangular platforms. Could the polygonal walls of Italy originate from one and the same people and be older than what is officially thought today? From the site of Göbekli Tepe in Turkey, which has been dated with established scientific methods to the 10th millennium BC, we know that, at that time, people around the Mediterranean were capable of carving and transporting 10-ton blocks of stone. Considering this finding and our observations, we think that an older origin of the polygonal walls of Italy cannot be excluded. We go on to the second crucial question. How were they built? It is no coincidence that polygonal walls attract a lot of attention from architects. In the past 200 years, architects have been on the front line in the study of polygonal walls. In our opinion, this is due to the fact that an architect in front of any construction immediately wonders, how did they do it? How would I do it with today's technology? 
The point is that there seems to be no obvious reason to do something so complicated when erecting a wall. Every stone has a unique position in the wall and had to be custom carved to fit that position. This assumes the necessity to carve it either according to a precise plan or in a sequential manner, one stone after the other. This is a colossal job when we consider that many stones weigh from a few hundred kilos to several tons and that the total length of all the walls we visited sums up to over 25 kilometers, which is just a fraction of all the polygonal walls that are found in central Italy. This mighty undertaking has not yet, in our opinion, a clear explanation. The third question is, what was their purpose? According to most archaeologists, it was either defensive or structural. But studies have also shown that some of the sites have astronomical orientations, which suggest some sacred, symbolic or ritual meaning behind the constructions. In order to try to fathom the mystery of the wall's purpose, we have also done some dowsing measurements of the overall life energy. In most sites, we were able to detect levels of energy which increase with each ring of walls. The highest levels were always measured on the polygonal platforms, usually placed on the highest point of the hill and surrounded by one or two wall rings. These measurements give support to the explanation of these sites as sacred in nature. If we put these walls into a wider global perspective, we recall the fact that similar polygonal masonry can be found all over the world, in addition to the already mentioned places Peru, Egypt, Cambodia, Turkey, Japan and Easter Island, we could see similar construction styles in Malta. Greece has a large quantity of sites with polygonal walls – Mycenae, Tyrians, Delphi, Casope, Gla, Pnyx, and there is even a polygonal pyramid at Hellenicon, just to mention a few. Something has been found in Bosnia as well. Other types of ancient constructions are spread around the world. Pyramids are found in Central America, in South America, Egypt, Iraq, Cambodia, Indonesia, Mauritius, Canary Islands, Sardinia, Sicily, China and other places. Styles change, but the basic structure is always the same. Megalithism is also found around the world. The largest stone blocks that we are aware of are in Lebanon at Baalbek. Up to 1600 tons in weight, at the quarry a few unfinished blocks still lie around. Others have been carried for 900 meters to the temple location. Today's most powerful cranes are capable of lifting up to 20,000 tons, but they either move on the water or carry weight for a very short distance. Could we transport? with today's technology, 800 ton blocks for that distance? All of these facts, together with many other types of evidence, which include geological, astronomical, mathematical and other observations, have been interpreted by many researchers as corroborating the hypothesis that we are looking at the remains of an ancient, 
highly advanced global civilization of which little is known. Research must go on to further shed light on the important questions raised by these ancient sites. We'll keep on searching until we stumble onto another stone riddle. <laughs>